Jennifer, it is a pleasure to have you on Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We're going to talk about your career. You've had a long career in HR and how you got here is pretty interesting too. So how did you land in HR all those years ago? Yeah, it's a, probably a non-traditional story. I, I call myself homegrown HR, if you will. So I you know, went to school for marketing, thought I was going to change the world with advertising and marketing. Joined Teach for America after school, where they basically teach non-teaching majors how to teach. So mm. taught for three years, inner city Nashville, um, seventh grade math, and then was an administrator and was supposed to open a school. And I was speaking on a panel about teacher readiness. And the chief people officer for a company I worked for came up and said, hey, you're going to come work for us and be a recruiter. And I was like, wow. <laughs> what? Okay. Yeah, right. I'm a, I'm a teacher. A little mortified now knowing who he was. But um, yeah, so I, I kind of gave them a run for their money for a few months till the end of the school year. One of the VPs, I made him call me at 5 a.m., uh, every three months, because that was when I went into school. Uh, eventually, ended up going there and, and started as a recruiter, and then, you know, kind of worked through different jobs, kind of increased my responsibilities, and did a little bit of everything there. So there's, there's some tie-in with teaching and, and HR. Yeah, right? you're like coaching and mentoring managers and, and leaders how to how to be good at their jobs, right? Absolutely. It's people ask me, how did you go from teaching to HR? I said. It's basically the same thing. You're helping mm -hmm. people make better decisions than the ones they're making and training them on different topics. So Agreed. it's just how do you tailor your message? <laughs> and even on the policy side with HR, you have to, you know, there's rules and policies and teachers have the same thing. There's rules and guidelines for how students need to to behave in the classroom, right? <laughs> Should behave and do behave are two different be, things. But right. yes. Uh, so you, after that, so you got into HR, you spent yeah. about a decade working yeah. for a Fortune 91 retailer. So large, large company, very successful. Uh, what were some of the roles you had? Just like a few of the titles. Yeah. So I'm typical business partner supporting, you know, field operations, uh, ran an employee relations team of 30 who did all remote investigations. That was mm. very interesting. Um, and then supply chain. So supporting distribution centers. Uh, so kind of ran the gamut of, right. of every part of the business. What were some of the biggest accomplishments you had during all those jobs? Or, or maybe pick one of the jobs that was most fulfilling to you and some accomplishments. I think, well, I'll go personally and professionally. Personally, I think running the employee relations department was mm. fulfilling. I, I don't that sounds a little weird, but um, <laughs> I am a very, it does. I am very conflict avoidant in my personal life. It, it makes me sweat. I'm, I'm yeah. just not comfortable with conflict. And so when they offered me the role, I thought, do you have any idea of, of who I am as a person? Because this does not suit me. And that's exactly why I went to it. And so personally, it helped me really develop the skills to say, okay, not every conflict is a bad thing. It can mm. be a good thing. It can help level set or get on the same page. And so I think personally that helped me a lot. Um, professionally, I think probably developing um, new programs. We launched a couple new programs in my last few years that really helped the employees with recognition. Um, so dabbled a little bit in talent mm. development and recognition, which I, I just love. And I got to see some of the um, output of that before I left and then did a lot of work with the Women's Professional Network and Women's History Month. So um, those were some of my professional accomplishments, but personally it would probably be employee relations. First started in HR, did you get a chance to, to dabble in a lot of different things? I know you said you were starting with recruiting, but did you get a chance to like learn various areas of HR or were like when you're working for a large company, do you get like specialized really quick? Yeah, when, when I started there, um, there was very much the, the mindset of find the talent, train the skill. And, mm. and to be honest, I was a teacher. I had no skill in HR. So it was, I didn't. Um, and so the mentality was just, you know, I always said, yes, I, I did. Anything they asked or any opportunity I, I'd put my name out there for because I thought if I can just at least try it, um, I can figure it out. And, mm -hmm. and so I got to dabble and, and my 
goal was to meet people in different areas. So I did that through, you know, different councils or partnering with field partners, things like that, getting connected. You, you have to put effort into it, but um, I think that's what helped me kind of move my way around the, the company. What is HR roles do for a large company like that. So if you have multiple locations, it's retail. So, and you talk about distribution centers too. So that's kind of like yeah. a side thing. So you got retail centers, distribution centers. So no customer facing stuff is just distribution. And then you, you're working in corporate, I'd imagine. So yeah. like, what is, what is your layer of HR doing and who are you interacting with? What's like sort of the, the organizational structure there? Yeah. So. Obviously, the corporate headquarters is dealing with anybody who is, you know, procurement, VPs, yeah. things like that. Um, that's the one part I never did was really supporting the corporate office. Mm -hmm. um, I much more enjoyed the field. Uh, I think it's call me call me crazy, but I liked the craziness of it. Um, <laughs> I think you got to have a special crazy to be in retail, honestly. Um, and so it was mostly supporting the people who supported our employees. So district managers, regional directors, we would support them, help them with talent development, help them with recruiting and selection and um, things like that. And then on the supply chain side, you're you're in the buildings, you mm -hmm. have HR in the buildings, so you're supporting your team that is in the buildings to help with their initiatives, but you're also going to them. So I, my customer was the employee most of the time. Um, now in employee relations, obviously dealt with a lot more of the external yeah. facing factors, but. Yeah, let's let's talk about the employee relations. So you spent <laughs> your, your longest stint of your yeah. career was in, in this role of director of employee relations. And a large part of it was during the pandemic. So I, let's unpack all that. Like what sort of issues would come up? What is it? What did employee relations do? I know that's, there's probably a, a big, long list of things you do. Yeah. And then what kind of issues would come up that you would be you know, solving, solving some yeah. of those problems? So I had a team of 30 and so their roles changed not, not too drastically. It just, uh, everything became a little more volatile right. because tensions were high and you're dealing with customer interactions, right? So people are stressed. They still have to get the things that they need, but they're freaking out understandably because yeah. nobody knows what's going on. So everything was just exacerbated. Our investigations were exacerbated everything seemed to be at a level 100 because it was so emotional. Um, and then we took on the accommodations process. So if you think about everybody wearing masks, right. people that could not medically wear masks, people that religiously had religious accommodations mm -hmm. that they did not want to cover their face. And so, I mean, in 24 hours, we had rolled out, how do you get 100,000 employees to provide restrictions, get documentation, figure out if you'll accommodate it and provide them something so everybody knows, because also people are coming into the store, they see you without a mask and they freak out at you. So how do yeah. you provide them something to protect them so they're not getting in fights, mm -hmm. literally? Um, so that was some of what my team helped deal with. From my side, it was developing the processes. How do we legally yeah. protect our employees? How do we legally protect ourselves? And then, you know, obviously employee handbook changed, code of conduct, all of the repercussions that came from that. Um, I would say the only advantage of it is we already worked remote. My team had worked, I've worked remote since 2013. So everybody was getting used to that. We already had that covered. It was just the workload that kind of exacerbated. Wow. Yeah, that, that sounds challenging. Um, but you like the chaos. You already said that. So I, I just, do. <laughs> this is probably fine for you. Did any of those direct directives come down from corporate or did, or was your unit in charge of uh, setting the processes, updating the handbook? Like how was the structure in terms yeah. of like responsibilities? Yeah. So that was where I came in. You know, my, my team, I would ask, my biggest role was to support them. They were the ones that were dealing with all the craziness. So mm -hmm. I did everything I could to emotionally support mm -hmm. them. If I would ask, I would purposely say, take, take two hours today, take time off. You know, they needed to manage their own things going on. Um, and then I would play the middleman. So they would say, hey, Jennifer, we're seeing these types of things come up. I would then go to our legal team. I would go to our VPs and say, hey guys, here's what we're seeing. Here's what we think we can do. This is what my team is thinking. And so playing that middleman in between to keep everybody in line with, with what's going on and then how do we fix it upstream, um, 
interestingly enough, we moved very quickly. I mean, we would change whole processes within a week, which is kind of unheard of for as big of a company as it was. Yeah, I would think, I mean, I've worked for a small company forever, so I, I couldn't even imagine like shifting a, a process. It seems like it would take forever. I've heard, you know, you always hear the red tape and bureaucracy yeah. and layers of yeah. whatever and cutting through that's probably pretty hard to make a shift, but maybe, it, I mean, just maybe it's a testament to the culture that you had at this yeah. organization. I, I also think it's, um, it, building relationships. That's, that's one of my biggest strengths, I will say. Yeah. And now it's something I prided myself on because I knew, and I've always known that you don't need the relationship until you need it. And right. if you don't already have it, you're not going to get it. And so, um, you know, I had really strong relationships with the legal department, with our VPs, things like that. So that by the time this rolled around, it was just, okay, let's roll. Um, I, I didn't have the foresight to ever see a pandemic coming, but um, it definitely helped. <laughs> right. Can you let me under the hood a little bit? Like what kind of issues would come up? Like the, I don't know how much you could say about it. But oh, like just, yeah. I'm, I'm just curious, like on an average, you know, average week, what kind of things would you be dealing with? A lot of um, surprisingly, well, I don't know if it would surprise people. A lot of discrimination claims, mm. um, people feeling like they were treated differently um, but not able to understand why. So a lot of it was buzzwords. And so okay. a lot of what my team did was digging in to say like, wh what made you feel like you were treated differently? What made you feel like your experience was mm. different from someone else? And usually that helped a lot of it because they'd say, well, they don't like my brother's cousin. Well, well that's not discrimination. And so trying to help them understand that to leave them in a good place too. And that's yeah. kind of what we prided ourselves on was how do we leave them in a good place? So it's not just, okay, your case is closed, you know? Right. Um, so it was a lot of that. And then during the pandemic, it was a lot of violence, um, workplace oh. violence, because again, emotions were high. Oh yeah. People were like, you have a direct impact on my health mm. and what's going on. This is my only time I get out of the house. Things are stressful at home, you know. We saw all of that, and and it happened in our in at the stores too. So Absolutely. a lot more of that, which it was so heartbreaking to see, but was just a such an indicator of what was going on in the world. So yeah, did you get to work on a lot of proactive things too? I mean, yeah. like, so those are the reactive, nasty yeah. things that might come up. But yeah, what kind of things would you do from a proactive standpoint? So that was my biggest take um, when I came into the department. I said, enough is enough of us just working cases and, and being caseworkers. Like that, the, that is part of the job, yes, but that is a skill you can teach quickly. The bigger part is how do we become proactive business partners? So I, as an employee relations manager, can say, hey, Brandon, you've had six cases of workplace violence in your district this past year. Let's get, here's some training that we can implement. Let's get ahead of it. They're all caused by these type of conflicts and using the data to drive some of those decisions. Because we had pretty significant amounts of data. We implemented a new system. So we could pull all these different kinds of data. So how do you teach, train, and develop? Mm -hmm. Because we're in place, these stores were in places where people honestly don't know. And so people are like, oh, everybody should know better. If you were raised in this small town, you actually might not know that that's not the way that people like to be spoken to. And so really helping get ahead of that with, with some of the data was, was probably my most proud moment with the department because we made some significant impact and were able to show like, hey, we're not just working these cases, closing them out. Like I can show a direct impact that I had in this area. Um, and it was fulfilling for the team too, as opposed, because it can be whew, brutal out there working cases day in and day out. Oh, I'm sure. Well, and that leads me to the next part of your career. You left and then joined a SaaS startup. I did. I did. As a VP of HR. So that's a very drastic shift. Why yeah. did you make the leap to a small startup company? Yeah, I um, I always had this idea that if I ever got the opportunity to do my own thing with an HR department and have an impact on a smaller company, I would take it. So then the opportunity comes, you know, the universe tests right. you and says, prove it. <laughs> and whether you're ready or not, you might you might not get another chance at it. Would I say I was completely ready to take on this role personally and professionally? Probably not, now knowing what I know. Um, but again, I think it's if the opportunity comes up, you have you have to go for it. I also 
thank God, was presented with a pretty incredible opportunity with the company I joined, like the leadership team and Good. the way they function. And and so, um, yeah, yeah, it, it's been uh, quite a change, I'll say that. Oh, I'm sure. So you went from like, you you said you had 30 reports in the employee relations department at the, the big company and you go to yeah. a startup where you're probably either by yourself or maybe one or two employees. Yeah. Or are you by yourself? Or I don't know where you're at now. I have like, one project manager that flexes okay. between my department and other departments. Oh, a hybrid um, role. Those work. It's well. a hybrid one. Yes. It actually, <laughs> it's actually great because she's so great at processes that yeah. I'll be like, hey, I need you to help me work on this. And she, then she'll kind of go great. help with pitch decks and things like that, which yeah. she loves. Um, it is, I had almost 250 HR peers like across the organization to go from that to by yourself. Yes. It, it takes some mental fortitude. I'll say that Absolutely. at the beginning I was like, wow, this is a this is a different beast. I didn't know I was signing up for it. Yeah. Um, Be- before you took the role, did you pitch the leadership team or the whoever you interviewed with the exact team? Did you pitch them on your vision for how HR would be run at the company or like the culture? Like what did you tell them that you would would bring? Yeah, I think I just said one, I know I don't know everything. I am, as you can see from my career, I am willing to learn. I, I'm not going to know everything, but I am willing to take a chance, observe, learn. I truly believe in understanding the business as an HR partner because I can tell you all the fun, cool, sexy stuff we want to do. But if it's not driving what, what the business needs to drive, which is the bottom line or revenue or whatever investors are looking at, then there's no point. And two, I have a very interesting background where I can also help protect the company. Mm. And so if you don't have that in place, you're getting to a point where you're going to need that. And so I do have an interesting vantage point that I can advise on that. And I'm not saying you'll need that now, but maybe later. Mm -hmm. I also just want to protect the culture that you feel like you want for the future. Um, And how can we make sure we work together to do that? And, And that was kind of it. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really have a pitch. I just kind of was myself and yeah. that was it. Well, like in a startup, I'm, I'm sure establishing a culture and they maybe the, maybe the exec team, the owners of the, of the business, they have a vision for what culture would look mm-hmm. like, but establishing it early on in the early years is vital, right? Cause you, it's attracting, yeah. it's retaining people. It's, you know, um, so like how, what's your approach been in terms of like helping build that culture, um, see the vision through, like what is it like for you? Yeah. I think, uh, my biggest thing whenever I come into a new role or come to a new position is shutting up. (laughs) I mean, I hate to say it, but like you can always come into a position and think, you know, everything and you know exactly what should be done. You don't, and you're not going to know for the first 30, 60, 90 days. So your only job is to offer value where you can, Get an assessment of what's going on um, and then really make sure that what you're doing is aligned with where we see the team going. So one of the first things we did is I helped with an employee onboarding. How do we make sure that people have have a great experience coming on? Because Mm. regardless of what the vision is, that's got to happen. Yep. Um, we started recruiting and they'd been spending a lot of money on recruiting fees. So I said, okay, how can we make an applicant tracking system? And within a week, we had a robust process that everybody was aligned on. Um, so really making sure we're cutting costs there. Um, and then just adding value where I can. So like, mm-hmm. hey, you need me to call these people? I'll call them. You need me to write these emails? I'll write them. Because at the beginning, you don't feel like you're doing a lot. So adding yeah. value where you can and then understanding like, where does the company where can you start seeing some wins? Um, which, which is hard because you just feel like you're kind of creating your own work to some extent. Yeah. Um, luckily, I, I'm good at that. <laughs> I, I can relate to you in so many ways. So I, I'm, a, I'm a marketing leader inside yeah. of an HR and payroll processing company. So I'm like one or I've, I've, I'm an employee, but I'm like you, I'm kind of like, I'm the only person of my kind leading a function and you feel like, you know, often resource um, deprived. There's a million things to do in limited time. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, whereas like I look at the HR service side of our business and there's like 
30 consultants and I'm like, there's a million of them. <laughs> yeah. And like they have lots of people resources. So how do you grapple with that? Like you came from a place where there's like, what do you say? 120 HR peers to now you're yeah. one and a half ish that you just yeah. said. So there's a million things you want to do, but limited time. How are you spending your time and, and prioritizing what's uh, most important? Yeah. It's when I was, um, in my old company, producing was my main goal. If I was producing, then I was doing a good job. And it's been so interesting taking a different lens now. I used, my mom used to call me and she'd be like, what are you doing? And I'd be like, I'm walking and listening to a podcast. She's like, during a work day, I'm like, I am working. Like I'm trying to see what other companies are doing. How, what are the trends? How do yeah. we stay ahead of things? And so it's just, it's working in a different way because you only have so many things you can prioritize. You mm -hmm. only have so many things that you can push truly um, and frame up. And so how do you make sure they're the right things? You have to learn. You have to educate yourself. Um, and I'm not afraid to say that. Like I, I went in full honesty and I said, I don't know comp. I don't know benefits. Don't know it. I'll learn it if you need me to, but or I don't know it <laughs> or outsource it. But um, exactly. But, you know, I'll phone a friend, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not afraid to say like, I have no idea. Um, yes. It's just. Now your resources at a big company, when you say, I have no idea, you call somebody, you never have to admit you have no idea because you call all your peers to figure it out. Exactly. So I think it's, it's just, it's different. And I think it's having a humble approach. Yeah, I think that's I all you agree. can do. I like the, the way you seem like a curious person and in that you're just, I don't know it. And you're going to admit to the fact that you don't know it. And then you're going to either go learn, learn it or find the appropriate resource. So I love that about you. That's, I think that's, you're going to have a very successful career. Oh, thank you. Um, technology. So there's a mm. lot of technology entering into HR. There's, I mean, onboarding used to be so manual and now there's, there's technology for that. There's, you know, the applicant tracking system, as you talked about before, there's just so many things. And now you got AI coming in, it's going to disrupt HR space altogether yeah. too. So how are you, and maybe you have to advocate for like a budget for some of these tools, but how, do, how does that operate? Like you see a process and you're like, ah, we can automate this through a technology. Like what, what kind of conversations are you having about that? I think the first thing is figuring out where your company is in the life cycle. Like how open are they to it? Mm. Um, I can't, and I think HR is particularly resistant. Like it, yeah. it's like, it's like, you know, payroll systems. I want to do it my way this way the entire time. Yes. I'm sure you deal with that all the time. And so okay. it's figuring out where is everybody? And, you know, I, a lot of what I get is, well, you know, they're going to take over our jobs. Everything's going to take over our jobs. I'm like, well, one, we're not the Jetsons. And two, that's exactly what they said when they put ATMs in. Bank teller said, we are never going to have any jobs. And there's more banks than we've ever had in, in our history. So just acknowledging it, accepting it. I think that's one part of it. I think the second part is figuring out how can I use it um, and educate myself. So perfect example is writing content for development programs. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that I'm going to use chat GPT and copy paste it in. <laughs> but what I am saying is that I'm going to use it as lead at, at least for a framework. Yes, because at, at five o'clock at night, when I have to write 10 emails, I am just not, that is just not where my brain needs to be. And I'm, I'm shocked. So why not use a tool to plug it in, to automate the framework of the email, put my own spin on it and send it. Like it just makes sense. We do it for everything else. Why wouldn't we use it in HR also? Policies, procedures, emails, like you can standardize so much. Yeah. Um, I just think it's, it's a wonderful tool. It's not the end all be all. I it's agree. not going to solve all your problems, but um, it, it's a tool. It's a tool. Like that's, that's what I always say about technology. Like you could either be scared of it and say that it's going to take all of our jobs or you can embrace it and say, this actually, you know, cuts down on the administrative work that I would have to do mm -hmm. the, the crap work that, you yeah. know, if this tool can do 90% of it and then I can use my creative brain to do the last 10% and put my own spin or voice or yeah. tone, whatever to it. You could build on that. It frees you up to focus on the most important stuff. And 
at the end of the day, I think like the employee experience is like the most important thing. And yeah. that that's where some of these these technologies do impact the employee mm. experience. Like they're they're used to one click buying on Amazon and TurboTax for doing their tax. They're the the they have demand like demands about an experience that they have as an employee. Yes. And that, that's why HR really has to get involved in technology and embrace it. Right. Absolutely. And I think you're, you're so dead on. Why would our personal life experience not match our professional life? <laughs> I can go on Amazon and buy anything I want and it'll be here by tomorrow. Why would I not have right. the similar instant gratification in my job? Why am I still emailing HR to get a copy of my pay stub to then be able to turn it in to verify my job. Like that's insanity. So um, I think anytime we can meet people where they are, or at least mm-hmm. understand what they want. Yeah. Um, why not? Well, even think about, you know, how we consume content. We yeah. have YouTube, there's Netflix. Like I go, we can watch anything we want. Like when mm-hmm. I, versus when I was a kid, you know, you have to wait for your favorite show to come on at like, 6 p.m. or something, (laughs) or you have to pop in a VHS or a DVD, like those days are gone. And the the people entering the workforce have have demands for now. I want it now on demand. And that goes for development opportunities. It's like, or an answer to a question, like you should have a knowledge base in place Mm -hmm. where they can self-serve or they can learn a new skill on demand. Like these are the things that I think we as HR professionals need to be thinking about. And and kind of going off topic there, but when you say what they want to learn about, that's not just with their job. I think if you can figure out a way to say, what do you want personally? Mm-hmm. What are your goals personally? What are the company's goals? And meet them somewhere in the middle. They're going to be bought in. So if their mm-hmm. personal goals are some type of development into product and they don't know nothing about product and you have that and it's going to help the company drive some type of bottom line metric, why would you not provide that? Yes, it's a per- personal goal, but you can meet somewhere in the middle. I think people are intimidated by the amount of content that's out there and they mm-hmm. think they have to have these ridiculous development programs. Keep it simple. Keep talk it simple. to people. Like just talk yeah. to them. Figure out what they want. That's a, that's well said. I, I think what employers and HR professionals often get wrong is they just, they're not they're not listening. They're not asking the questions of their people and finding out what they want out of their their work, their employer. Because oftentimes mm-hmm. they're asking those questions when it's too late. It's like they've already laughed they're doing an exit interview. And why not have those conversations like day one? And then on a regular basis. And I think people aren't going to take no as an answer anymore. It's, we have a world where if you get told no, you can find five other places to get it. And so why is HR the people that are the keepers of no? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd say mm-hmm. like, <laughs> you can still get to yes or figure out a resource or su- way to support them or whatever that is. It's so funny. I think people uh, hate coming to HR because they feel like they're going to be the moral police or get told Mm, no, or it's going to be some type of fight. That's not my fight. Like, I don't care. I just want to help figure out what you want and let's get there, you know? Yeah, I love that. It's interesting. What, as we close this discussion out, what's a piece of advice you have for somebody who's, you know, in an HR profession maybe making the leap like you did to a startup. What's what, what's something that you wish you would have known? You are going to have imposter syndrome. I think that's just part of it. Um, I think remembering that you don't need to produce to make yourself feel valuable. You are valuable and the time will come when you feel that. Um, so just, just take the time, learn, um, ask all the questions. And, and run towards what scares you. That's what I tell everybody. I'm like, if you get that pit in your stomach or you get that feeling of, I want to say no, then that's exactly what you should be doing. And that's how I felt with this company. When I went, I was like, I don't know if I can do that. And I said, you know what? If I'm feeling like that, then I need to do it. That's exactly what I need to do. So, um, you know, just always run towards, towards what scares you. On that note of imposter syndrome, because I feel that too often being, you know, isolated in my role. Having marketing peers helps. Learning new skills helps. Having tech 
like resources for technology and like other things that help me in my role all help. What's what sort of tools and people and what's, what's your toolkit as far as like making sure that you're moving forward and you're in your you have somebody to talk to like who's in your yeah. network what kind of tools and education are you paying attention to well now you know whether you like it or not but um I honestly that's why I started on podcasts because I was feeling isolated and yeah. I was I wanted to make sure that I was doing the right thing by my company and that involved me being educated and me having a network of people I could reach out to so I started emailing random HR podcasts. I was like, hey, <laughs> here's my LinkedIn profile. I got nothing to sell. Don't know if you want to, you know, chat. And, and you know, it's a it's 25% hit, 75% miss. But it's been so wonderful. I've met so many great people. I have so many great resource conversations. And um, so I think that's a huge one for me because, one, I love talking to people and hearing their stories and things like that. But two, it just helps me. And then I think the more that you can understand whatever your business is in, know that market. So we are a vertical SaaS company. You better believe I am learning as much as I can about SaaS startups, about fundraising, about venture capital. Wow. That has nothing to do with me. But if I can speak the language of the people that I'm interacting yeah. with every day, it, it's a no brainer. They're, they're of course going to want to engage with me more as opposed to if I'm like, well, let's talk about the learning and development plan. They're going to be like, okay, get out of here. So. Jennifer, thank you for coming on the podcast. I, I really enjoyed hearing your story and just talking, talking shop. So yeah. thanks for coming on. Where can people connect with you? Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, it's Jennifer Watson. Uh, feel free to find me there. My main name is Newville and like Nancy EU V like Virginia, I L L E done that a few times in case you can't tell. Um, but feel free to reach out on me there. I'm always on there looking for great talent. And so I'd love to hear from y'all. Thanks for coming on. Have a great day.